How do you define culture? Is it fashion or trends? Is it the truth we tell or the lies we believe? The word culture has the word cult in it, and sometimes the difference between a positive nurturing society and a cult can be found by looking at the traits and behaviors that are reinforced within the group. According to the dictionary, culture is the set of values, conventions, or social practices associated with a particular field, activity, or societal characteristic. Typically, it's paired with some kind of qualifier. Popular culture, startup culture, legal culture. Every group has its own brand of mob mentality. Behaviors or practices that most of the members of that group follow, and for the most part accept as part of the culture. But what happens when these behaviors are unhealthy? What happens when the culture builds walls? What happens when the negative aspects of a culture are looked at as badges of honor or marks of shame? It's hard to have a subjective view when you're immersed in something, but the data doesn't lie. There's a mental health crisis in law, and it's time to start asking some questions. Let's dig in. Lawsome, the podcast for law firms, powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that can play hide-and-go-seek with your inner child and never lose. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in personal and professional development. I'm Jake Sanders, five-time gold medal winning mental gymnast. And joining me in the virtual gym today, as always, is Paul Luretton Julius. Paul. I'm just happy to be here and represent my team. In these mental gymnastics. So first up is the pummel horse. <laughs> it sounds like we're winning at that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Skip the medal ceremony. What's on the show today? On the show, <clears throat> we address the elephant in the room and talk about the mental health crisis in law with an article from AboveTheLaw.com. We talk to President Magazine editor Daniel Fish and discuss a recent expose on mental health and lawyers, and he shatters my vision of Canada as a free-living utopia, and as always, we throw Daniel to the wolves with 10 questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The article today is from AboveTheLaw.com. It's Can We Finally Talk About the Elephant in the Room? Mental Health of Lawyers by Gina Cho. I thought it was kind of a, um, it's old news in some respect. I think everybody knows that it's, uh, there is, it's a hard job. It's a hard vertical to be in the legal profession. Um, but I like that it isn't just about depression because I think mental health is just kind of equated with depression really. And I think mm. there's so many other aspects that this addresses that, it's anxiety, it's vicarious trauma, it's imposter syndrome and, and those kind of things. And that can happen during law school. And when we talk to Daniel later, he kind of um, puts some of that generation of the mental health crisis in the idea of law school and how it has um, students prepared to maybe see small things as very big problems. And I thought that was that's a very cogent way to approach this. What was your take on it? It was kind of a contrast from Daniel's article, I thought. Mm -hmm. But but I like that because this one goes uh, kind of for the obvious stuff, the depression, alcoholism. Uh, but I think it's important to talk about that and to, sure. to drag that thing out into the into the daylight. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a correlation. And it says in the study here that the uh, ubiquity of alcohol in the legal professional culture certainly demonstrates both its ready availability and social acceptability. And mm. that's a lot what we're talking to Daniel about later is this culture, mm. this culture that, you know, in some cases uh, fans the fire, to, you know, mm -hmm. is, is a bit of a catalyst or even even the cause mm. of a lot of these behaviors. Oh, yeah. um, or, or feelings or, or, you know, as, as it can develop, uh, syndromes or whatever. Yeah. I like that. They're saying it's not just you. Right. You know, I, I like that this article and Daniel's article and, and in his interview later, you know, he talks about it too, that like, there's you know, some of these things, like a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of stress, that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. everybody, you, you, even, you know, professional, high performing professional athletes, they still say, I get scared. 
Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit of fear can be good. Mm -hmm. Um, But where it's to the point where, you know, you can't leave the house, um, where you're you're depressed or scared and starting to treat it with alcohol. I mean, I think there's you know, that's a little bit beyond this show. But, you know, now you're on this this merry go round of, well, I don't feel good, so I'm going to drink. But that makes me feel worse. And then it's, you know, just one thing leading to another. Which is what this article talks about, um, right? Right. Well, you know, and, and it's not brought up. I mean, that's the thing. Is it's just like, yeah, that's how it is. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, and but there's other coping mechanisms that aren't addressed. And alcohol is just a ubiquitous thing. I think a lot of people are drinking, and a lot of people enter that feedback loop of mm. drinking and then feeling bad and then drinking. And I mean. I don't, I, we don't need to go too far into it. Um, I mean, your pro the thing is your problems are still there. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's almost like you can, you know, whatever, um, all of these things obviously can be factors that lead to, you know, drinking and all this stuff, but there's other, other stuff too, uh, where they talk about higher prevalences of, you know, suicide, mm-hmm. um, anxiety, mm-hmm. anxiety, mm-hmm. you know, people, don't think of that as like a real thing, but it mm-hmm. is real. I mean, you can you can be crippled by anxiety. You can be absolutely unable to do the things that you want to do. No, it's not even that. Are... No, you think you're gonna die. I, yeah. oh, I've I've yeah. had I've had a couple panic attacks, and it was before I got married. And you know, there's big stuff happening in my life, and I wasn't taking care of my body. And you know, and then I start getting nervous, and then it just it's straight up K two. Himalayan peaks of anxiety. And you brought up a really good point. It isn't just you. And that's what I think the most important part about this discussion and why Gina Cho wanted to do this and why the ABA is partnering with substance abuse counselors and why there's this big discussion is because in order to address things, you have to know that it's happening. And like the Me Too movement, I mean, that brought everybody out. And they said, you know what? That's happened to me too. And it was in science and it was in government and it was in politics and it was in the entertainment industry and everybody got a chance to say, Hey, but the only way they could do it is if everyone else kind of came out. And that's why the, the tips that Gina gives in her article is you start a dialogue with, you know, people in your law firm or other lawyers say, Hey, how are you feeling? Ask questions, gather data, and then start with yourself. If you really want to change, you know, this, this crisis, and maybe turn it into something different, you know, a conversation, then you got to start with yourself and ask yourself those questions. And, and, and it is that, that Chianti uh, at Wednesday night, you know, and you're like, Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe is that necessary? See if you can go without it, you know, but you know, if you're sniffing glue in the parking lot behind (laughs) the court, you know, and you're huffing into a paper bag, you know, I would, it's, I might hire you. I don't know. Probably an indicator that you might be a great it's, lawyer. It's a good time to talk to somebody. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, maybe talk to um, Daniel Fish. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's interesting that you know none of us are are by any any stretch uh, mental health professionals, but it's something that we've all you know discussed with. with people. Oh, but I've had anxiety and, and I've been in, I've been in, you know, the law firm and, and I know that it's high, high stress and, and hearing from all of our guests running a business, is not easy, you, no. you know, so lawyers it's, it's yeah, no, we are not mental health professionals. You let that be disclaimed. Yeah. So we got that out of the way, but it's a, it's a good interview. And I think there's a lot of relevant information and some things that might be kind of surprising for people. Um, mm. but I, I mean, the biggest, the biggest, uh, I, I think you're totally right in that the biggest takeaways here between this article, um, from Gina and mm. what we talk about later with Daniel mm-hmm. is that, um, it's more common than you think. And it's, it's okay to get help. And it's not okay to think that you have to feel this way all the time by yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And so we're honored that we found him all the way from Canada. Um, and he helps us understand some <laughs> misconceptions about the health system up there too. So uh, stick around. It's a lovely interview and, um, and stay awesome. Yes. Let's do it. And now a word from our sponsor. 
We really have a relationship with Consult Webs that goes beyond simple business-to-business marketing. Uh, we have grown up with them as a company. They were there for us when we started. We were there for them when they started. So I think that we were Consult Web's first personal injury client 15 or 16 years ago. I've been working with them directly for 10 years now, and they've always been a fantastic partner. It's vitally important to us that when somebody says you should hire Bellic and Fox, and they go to the Bellic and Fox website, they're going to go beyond the website and contact us. They understand storytelling, they understand technology, they understand a website isn't just text on a page, it's how you create an expectation for what that means to, to work with us. When we get a case, they are very excited in a really genuine way that I think reflects the fact that they sort of view their success tied to ours. Um, so that's, that's why we've continued to use them. I've never had anything but praise for how they've been able, been able to market our website. Go to consultwebs.com to learn more. And now for a awesome interview. Daniel Fish is the senior editor at Precedent, Toronto's lifestyle magazine for lawyers. A former intern at the magazine, Daniel graduated from Carleton University's journalism program and has a master's in English from the University of Guelph. Daniel won gold at the Canadian Business Media Awards for his piece on the future of law and his continued exploration of the things that interest lawyers has provided the legal community with many thought-provoking and insightful articles. This immersion into the lawyer lifestyle is what has brought Daniel to the show today. Welcome to Awesome, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Uh, it's our pleasure as well. Uh, let's jump right into it. You've written numerous articles on lawyers and the practice of law. What interested you in the mental health aspect of it? So uh, there's a couple of things. I guess the, the way I would start is to say that we had seen at Precedent Magazine um, a lot of the studies on mental health and the law. Uh, we knew, for example, that things were getting worse. Um, there was a study that came out last year that talked about how close to 28% of lawyers struggle with depression, uh, despite the fact that the illness only afflicts 8% of the general population. We knew that anxiety hits 19% of lawyers, but only 12% of all other adults. Um, and so we'd seen that and we'd seen some of the coverage, but I think a lot of it was pretty surface level. Um, it only really offered two explanations for that statistical discrepancy. One was that cases are high stress, lawyers feel enormous pressure to succeed, and so that sort of wears on their psyche. Uh, and then the other one was, not surprisingly, that lawyers work long hours and therefore they don't have a ton of time to unwind or exercise, spend time with loved ones. Uh, but those explanations didn't feel complete. Uh, it seemed like there there was a lot that was being missed. In fact, it only really addressed one component of mental health, and that was sort of work-related stress. And it didn't really get to the heart of what mental illness is. Um, and at root, a mental illness is sort of when you're having an emotional response, whether that's anxiety or sadness, that is disproportionate to your circumstances. Um, so I thought on top of the sort of workaday stress that lawyers are feeling, certainly a problem to be discussed and dealt with, there also must be something about the practice of law that is actually warping one's sense of reality. And I know that sounds dramatic, but if we're talking about mental illness, that really is what we're talking about. We're talking about um, a worldview that's untethered from reality. And so that was the hypothesis I started from, uh, and that's what I built my reporting around. That kind of leads into the next thing that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of articles about mental health and lawyers that focus strictly on uh, depression and all the, the issues that come with it, like suicide, substance abuse, uh, stuff like that. But your article is really interesting in that it approaches mental health from more of this cultural perspective. And, you know, could you tell me a little bit more? Was this a deliberate choice? Uh, and it sounds like you talked about it a little bit there. But, I mean, as you got further into it, were you led down this path? Um, you know, into, is this, are these, uh, you know, does it create these kind of problems or does it draw people with these mm. problems into this line of work? I guess, put it that way. Well, so I will, I'll, I'll answer those two questions in reverse order. The first one that you asked, which is the idea that 
is there something about a legal career that is somehow luring people who have a pre-existing mental health condition to the practice? You are not the first person to suggest this theory to me. Um, <laughs> no, you're not. And and it was one of the things that I went in looking at, and it's something that I talked to experts about, and it's something that I talked to my subjects about because I did speak to about a half a dozen lawyers who struggle with mental illness ranging from anxiety to depression. And I think that that is probably more myth than fact. Um, none of the experts I spoke to suggested they think there's any evidence of that. In, in fact, it, there was one study that sort of tracked law students and it sort of took a, uh, a prognosis of their mental health in, in first year up to third year, and it, they were getting worse over time. So I think it's much more likely that people are coming to the profession at a similar rate of mental illness to the general population, mm -hmm. and that there is something about the profession that's making them worse. Uh, there could be, it, it is possible that, that it could be there could be some degree to which people, the profession is luring people with some sort of condition, um, but there's no evidence of that at this time. But but it, it, it's interesting, it is such a problem that there has been so much speculation about that. Um, so that, that's my gut answer on, on the second question. On the first one about sort of legal culture, that was really not necessarily where I started from, um, but when I asked myself, okay, what about the profession might be making people more sick? If I can't talk about things like hours and I can't talk about things like just the sort of general stress that you feel on cases. And that is really where the legal culture emerged as the most likely explanation for why people are struggling so much. And then it, we get into a whole sort of Pandora's box. There are so many different cultural factors at play. But in general, I, I sort of found in talking to subjects and people who are struggling that the culture was really what was most at play. And so – Sorry, Paul. I had a quick nope. question about law school. In the article, it kind of unpacks the reality that law school drills in this fear of very small, minute things becoming gigantic problems. Like if you don't catch one small thing, like a comma, a typo, these kind of things can lead to giant issues. So I'm thinking that that culture and tradition starts in some respects. I mean, outside of public perception of what lawyers are, but in law schools, how, how does that culture and tradition start from law school? And then how does that kind of bleed into the elements you found? So I think you're right on. I, I think that a lot of these cultural problems do start in law school. And, and I can't tell you how many lawyers who I've talked to who said that maybe they didn't have any kind of mental health problem until they arrived at law school, or maybe they had one that they had found coping mechanisms for, and then everything sort of blew up once they were in law school. So I, I think that that really is the source of a lot of this problem. Um, I've heard lawyers really describe law school as kind of the original sin of the profession, that that is, is really the source of a lot of this. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the idea that if you're doing an assignment that a comma or a missed footnote, the stakes are so high. And I think there's no question that the way that the academic rigor is imposed on students perpetuates some of this idea that you can't make any mistake. If you make the tiniest mistake, you are a failure. And imagine having anxiety where your brain is all, all already telling you, you are, you know, at the high end, your brain might be consistently telling you you're worthless, you're not good enough. And then to have that sort of reified by law school culture, um, you can imagine how big of a problem that might be. The other thing I would say about law school is that it, how it defines success. A lot of people start law school with, you know, an idea to be a kind of social justice warrior. They're going to help make society better. But when they arrive at law school, all of a sudden success becomes you're going to, you got to make a lot of money. You got to get work at a big corporate firm. And then you have law students who didn't go to law school doing that all of a sudden doing battle with each other for this small pool of jobs. So now all of a sudden they're competing for a job they didn't know they wanted. And if they don't land that job, and many of them don't because there's only so many to go around, they all of a sudden feel like they are a failure, like their life is over, their career is over. And of course, debt compounds this problem. They imagine they can never repay this debt. And these are small problems, actually. Um, not necessarily the debt one, which we can talk about later. But if you don't land a, a job at a, at a big firm and make boatloads of money in your first year out of law school, that doesn't mean your life is over. But law school culture convinces you that it is. That's a fantastic point, because if I if I you know, worked my ass off to get into this law school and then worked my ass off to get into the top 10 of the class. If I end up in some rinky dink third rate law firm, you know, that's going to look, my whole career is off track. You know what well, I mean? Right. So and, I see it. And even the idea that 
a third rate law firm is a rinky dink law firm. I mean, that that is too also a skewed perception of reality. There are law firms in Toronto that might be second tier or third tier, but that's really just public perception. They're great law firms with terrific partners and mentorship programs, and you shouldn't feel like a failure if you're working for them, but yet you do. Well, and Daniel, I wanted to kind of bring up something. Um, as a musician, uh, I went to conservatory, and there's a lot of orchestra players, and there were all these violinists and violas and cellos. And so, when you look at or- orchestra, you know, and you say, "Hey, n- there's only one concert master. You know, there's only one person playing the first part, and then there's 30 people playing the second and third parts." Yeah, you know, and so right. everyone. Like, it's like you go to Top Gun, but then you're a crop duster, you know? And, but <laughs> but right. I, think, I think that Top Gun is cool while we get to fly and fight MiGs and stuff. Crop dusting is bringing, it's protecting crops. And there's some kind of like way that you can perceive the value of a position differently. But I know that one of the things that really crushed my dreams is when I didn't achieve them. And the best way is to realize that your dreams are sort of like cream cheese and you need to spread them across your life bagel or else <laughs> you're just going to like lose your, I'm sorry, I'm lost in all these you've metaphors. You've got a gift for language. Brought up, very well, well, please, please. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I, I've already Memories covered cream cheese, top gun and conservatory <laughs> violinists. But my point is, is that I think my, my, my life changed and a lot of depression and anxiety dropped when I realized I wasn't going to close out um, amphitheaters. I wasn't going to be a jazz lion in New York City. I was going to do this or that. And I think there's a lot of perceptions um, and there's something about the way we perceive success. So I, I think you really, you, you, you nailed it on the head, but there's also something that those lawyers could feel good about what they're doing but it isn't what they wanted so then they're just you know flagellating themselves that's what we're talking about that's what i'm saying and and i think uh, daniel you actually just busted me because i just bought right into it that it's the culture that says Mm. you know you this this is what's going to happen you know if you don't keep up this sustained effort you're going to end up you know, broke, <laughs> mm-hmm. you're going to end up a failure. Your whole career pivots on your first job, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's very much a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. One other thing that's a bit, almost kind of salt in the wound. And, and this is something that was surprising to me is that I also spoke with lawyers who are, as you put it, the top guns and that doesn't bring them as much happiness as they predicted either. Um, there, there are a lot of top partners who still feel like they might be even imposters in their own firm. They don't. They think that they somehow fooled their way to the top um, because they know how brilliant their colleagues are. Um, and of course, in law firms, no one wants to show any weakness. The idea that anyone might be struggling is, com- is, is a complete third rail. You can't talk about it. It's even worse when you think of the students who are really gunning for that job, because even if they do get it, it's unrealistic to assume that that will solve all of their problems. So the whole culture is, I mean, I mean it's really kind of messed up in a lot of ways. To expand on that a little bit, um, your article breaks these, these things down into categories with examples like fear, uh, sadness, rage, trauma, loneliness, and pressure. Um, so to, is there a certain level of like negative reinforcement that lawyers buy into that can exacerbate the problem? That's an interesting question. And I'm curious to know a bit more what you mean by negative reinforcement. I I would certainly say that there is a degree, there can be a degree of normalization, um, that, you know, it's normal to be going through an exam and feel like, uh, you can't sleep or that you're completely terrified so much so that you can barely eat, that that's just how things are supposed to be, Um, or that maybe you're on a trial and you're not allowed to take a break and you have to work until 11 p.m. every single day until the trial is over because that's just what you have to do. Um, And I think that does make reforms to the culture more difficult. Mm. Um, But I'm curious to know what you mean by the negative reinforcement, or or if I've answered your question, then hopefully that will also help. No, no, no. I'd I'd like to talk to this a little bit more because there's so many different examples in there. And and I think a lot of them kind of positive. So I do want to get to that in a little bit. But what I'm saying is that like fear and sadness and, and, and loneliness are all motivations for behaviors. You know what I mean? I don't want to be lonely, so I'm going to do something. I don't want to be afraid. So I'm going to do something. So I'm curious if people look at this 
and it, it just feeds on itself. Like when I'm afraid, I act a certain way. So if I'm afraid, that's okay. Mm. I guess put it this way. It seems like there's not as much positive reinforcement as there is negative reinforcement starting mm. in law school. You know, like we were talking before, you're afraid that you're going to miss a comma. There's this pressure that you're not going to graduate in the top of the class. There's this loneliness that, you know, I'm always in the library. And so these things just become normalized and that's your reinforcement. Like that's what you lean on. And these aren't necessarily positive emotions to have all the time. Right. They're, and, and they aren't, but I also think that to some degree living with them would also help. I, and, and I think that sometimes, you know, Let's take something like loneliness. One of the characters in my story was a law student who struggled with depression kind of her entire life, and it really got out of control in law school. And what really triggered it was the fact that she was single and all of her friends were not. Um, mm. And then that made her feel like, well, as a lawyer, she was as a law student, she was supposed to be on this fast track to success, but her life wasn't going exactly the way that she had hoped. So on one hand, yes, having the emotion of loneliness is is a bad thing. You don't want to feel too lonely. Um, but at the same time, you also want to have some positive Im image of being alone. Um, finding some way to bear with those emotions is also important. Not letting them get out of control is also important. Uh, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't want the profession to have uh, the vision of a successful lawyer being someone who is both successful at law and then never feels bad. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the AI. Yeah. Those are the AI lawyers that are right. coming on right. board. <laughs> right. Um, th that's not realistic either. So w when you were writing this article, was there anything that kind of surprised you um, when you were kind of confronting this issue, um, kind of upsetting the idea that culture and tradition is, is this um, kind of guiding force? But was there anything that shocked you or kind of surprised you when you were writing it? One one thing I, I was... a not necessarily surprised by, but one angle that I didn't expect would have such a role um, in exacerbating mental health problems um, are is sort of the issue of racism and sexism. Um, I knew that discrimination is a problem in the legal profession. That's pretty clear from the both the the sort of statistical gap between the number of men and women in in, in the partnership at the big firms. But what I didn't anticipate was how it can really exacerbate mental health problems. So I'll give you an example. If you talk to a lot of sort of young racialized women, it's pretty common that they will go to court and they'll be mistaken for a legal assistant or a clerk. Not that there's anything wrong with being a legal assistant or a clerk, but that that is the sort of general perception of what someone who looks like that is. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that that person has anxiety. So they're constantly hearing that they're not worth it. They're never going to succeed. They're, they're not, you know, they're a failure. And now all of a sudden, everyone is assuming that you're not even a lawyer. So those are the kinds of surprising things about legal culture that you would think, oh, that obviously that's unfair that, you know, a senior white lawyer is, is just assuming that the young black or South Asian woman is an assistant. But I wouldn't have imagined that that would play right into the kind of negative thought patterns that someone who has anxiety has. Um, and that was surprising to me in so far as it really illustrated how complex this whole problem is and how intertwined culture and mental health are. So can I ask a quick question for the sure. people out there? There's, there's a lot of um, older hands. Um, when you talked about normalizing the uh, soul crushing uh, approach to working, which is that you stub your life out for your career. And then later on, you get to drive a nice car around a hedgerow or something. <laughs> right. I worked at a firm. I was a marketing director for three years at a law firm. And I saw firsthand the, the stresses that came with the lawyers and that they were expected to be pushing and that if you had a little rage or something, it was, I think what it was, and Paul had a really great, like his approach to that was the negative reinforcement of it. But I think it's the framing of these issues where I'm using these emotions as motivations for actions. Um, and I think that if racism and diversity is, is kind of this coming wave that we need to start conceptualizing um talk to one of my friends he he has he owns, he owns like a machine shop he watches fox news constantly and right. he's he's upset that he has to approach conversations in a way where i don't assume gender norms i have to be a little bit more open to you know the idea of racism and sexism in the way that i talk as a white man so like these people become indignant I mean, it's slowly starting to kind of like uh, hold on. 
But I think there's there's some there's an indignity to white male lawyers who say, why do I have to watch what I'm doing, watch what I'm saying when when all we need to do is just work? I know you think it's racism and sexism, but you're just not willing to do the work, you know? And so it's just like there's just a dangerous reframing. And I'm just kind of playing the devil's advocate because the people who support diversity totally support diversity. You know, everyone of multiple different ethnicities, they want a shot. And people who want to give them a shot, they want to give them a shot. But people who can't conceive of why they should stop and think for a minute, like, well, should we have somebody on board or should we not? I mean, those people, right. what are you, what are your tips for those guys? <laughs> those people. <laughs> I would say to, I would say do your best to listen to the concerns of, of, of those from diverse communities. And I think that a lot of the time you might like, so the conception that um, those who want more diversity, what their primary concern is, is calling out senior white men as sexist to kind of, you know, put their feet to the fire and expose them. Mm -hmm. I I think that that's missing their point a little bit. And Mm. I don't speak for them myself, but you know, in, when I talk to young racialized lawyers in the Toronto legal profession, they really just want people to understand the concerns that they have, what it's like to go into client meetings and be the only person that looks like them, to be consistently mistaken for firm staff. There, this is, you know, it, it's not call-out culture. I think they just want those in senior positions to see where they're coming from and see how small offhand comments they might make can actually have real consequences on their careers and on the way that they're able to advance. So, so, I mean, does that help? I I would say that That completely helps because I I was just, um, I was looking up virtual reality as empathy training because a couple years ago, virtual reality was touted as this, this straight main line of empathy. Like if you want empathy, strap on this headset and you can be in a Syrian refugee camp. You know, strap on this headset and you can find out what it's like to live in solitary confinement, you know, and I I watch these videos. They are wildly impactful, but it's kind of fallen short because people who don't want to care about an issue, there's no way you can get them to care about it. There's something about empathy and being willing to just listen. And I think that's an easy step rather than saying you have to change everything. There's small little things that we can change. And I don't know. Yeah, no, well, that, that I think it answered, answered perfect. I had the opportunity to uh, attend a, a conference a couple of years ago, and it was all for attorneys who did workman's compensation, disability law, stuff like that. And I was having breakfast at a table with a couple of the, the attendees, and they were all women. And they were literally going through the things that was like, you know, this part, like we, we've, it's not a glass ceiling. It's like a hard closed ceiling for a lot of people. And this was only a couple years ago. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's there, it's real. And I can only imagine how frustrating that has to be after I, I can see it from their perspective. They have the same credentials, you know, I have the same credentials, but I'm not ever going to get past this, this level. No, I think that's right. And I think that really just seeing it all as kind of a murky brew of uh, influences and factors on your mental health. Uh, and it's difficult to pinpoint, you know, when we talked about sort of what are the problems of culture, it's difficult to pinpoint one exact piece of culture that is causing all of these problems. It's also difficult to even rank which ones are, are worse or more significant. Um, but that it, it's all a complex sort of matrix of issues that are that are affecting this. So it's interesting that we, we've been talking about this sexism kind of thing or, or you know, a, a, um, discrimination and different awarenesses and stuff. I noticed that there in your article, there's more women talking about it than men. Um, mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's also um, going to be kind of the savior of this is that, you know, do you, do you think women are more willing? I know in outside of um, the the law vertical um you know women are far more likely to get help for for mental health issues than men because men have this whole you know i'm gonna bury it tough it out men don't cry um 
I, I thought that was interesting that there were more women talking about it and more willing, like they had positive outcomes. Um, you know, so I, I just wanted, I guess, you know, this topic in general focuses on the negative and unfortunately that's lots of times because that's all we have. Um, but your article does illustrate some positive outcomes. So, you know, do you think there's some general positives that, that lawyers can look to? Sure. I'm happy to do that. I'm also happy to quickly comment on the fact that you mentioned that there were more women because that is interesting. And it's a pretty small sample size. I mean, I wasn't conducting a large study, so I don't know if the reason that I was able to find more women who were willing to talk on the record is because they have an easier time talking about it. But your general, your overall point is true. Um, Overall, women are more likely to suffer from mental illness and depression in particular. Um, but you're certainly right that men have a far more difficult time coming forward. Um, and in fact, that is why men are three times more likely than women to die by suicide when they have depression. Yes. Um, and, and that that is a, you know, that those, so th there's definitely a degree to which there is a unique problem with men and that they seem to feel the stigma and the shame more acutely than women. Um, and that certainly has to be addressed if, in, in general as we try to uh, bring people who have mental health issues to the appropriate treatment. Um, so, so there's no question that that's an issue. On the point of looking for some sort of optimism in this, I would say that the fact that you know I was even able to find five lawyers who could who would talk on the record about their problems is a sign of optimism. It's a sign that, that the stigma is decreasing. Um, things are improving in society. We are getting to a place where we can talk about this. And, and that is so important because unless you do that, people are not going to come forward. And, and, and for every person who does come forward and is open about this with their friends, their family, their law firm, the more likely it is that someone's going to hear that message and get help. So the more we talk, the better. And I do think we're talking about it more than we ever have before. And it's tough. I mean, it's tough. You can't, I mean, in, in any job, you can't go to your boss. I, I mean, it feels weird to go and be like, Hey man, um, I, I don't feel like I can get out of bed. You know, like that's, it's becoming easier. Um, and, and I would hope that with, with, you know, law firms and lawyers that does as well, but I could see it being even a bigger hurdle because in something where it seems like the culture teaches you to look for weaknesses um, having something like that, you know, that would be seen as a crack in the armor as opposed to something that needs to be addressed and you'll be better. That's right. I think the culture is completely upside down on that. I think what we need to think of is that people who are willing to come forward and be honest about something they're struggling with, that that's actually a sign of strength, not mm. of weakness. Definitely. Um, but we're not there yet. Definitely. Well, so, and Daniel, what I would think is the only way you could get people, I think having these conversations um, you know, ha making it more of a broader discussion is important, but I think that if you equated mental health wellness towards increased firm performance, all you would need to do is just get a couple numbers in here and then people would be doing this left and right. But the fact is, is that people think whatever your mental health stresses are in your life, you can still push out work. Yeah. And as long as the work is getting done, I don't necessarily care if you're sad or lonely or traumatically depressed or whatever. It's, it's I'm, I'm just kind of being the devil's advocate. Of course, I care if people are sad. Right. But if I'm running a firm, I don't have time to sit here and br like Brianne Brown, your empathic um, shortcomings so we can learn about, you know, it's like that's why I have an HR person. Or that's why I have this or that. I think that all, you could see a giant watershed moment if you just said firms that address their associates' mental health and, and you know, have a plan in place and a strategy in places where they can have these conversations will experience three times revenue growth. And the only reason why is because your people want to be at their job and then they'd want to work. Because I think there's something that says – Mental health is aside from the work that gets done, you know, and it's like a I mean, side effect, <laughs> right? Well, but, and it's something that I don't know what you're talking about. You're sad. That's your own thing. If you can work, you can work, but if you can't hit the road, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry I'm being cold and stuff. Cause this is a nice touchy feeling conversation, but I know there's a lot of people who, if you just told them 
Is there any, do well, you have any law firms that have done this or that like can show that there's increased revenue in making people happier? I don't know how closely they can necessarily draw a through line between mental health initiatives and increased profits or increased revenue. There are certainly more firms, in particular the big international firms, that have started to offer you know, free access to therapy at the law firm. But of course, not every lawyer wants to use that because they're worried about confidentiality. Sure. Um, and so uh, I don't know how effectively they've measured it. I do think that firms are more understanding of, of two things when it comes to the connection between the health of their workforce and their bottom line. The first one is something called presenteeism. This is something that people are starting to think about where you, you don't want people coming in, clocking in, clocking out, doing the work, but not being present for the entire time. And so they might not be doing as good of a job as they are, even if they're perhaps getting the files out on time. Uh, and then the second thing is retention. You know, you mentioned there might be a managing partner who says, you know what, do the work. And if you can't handle it, hit the road. If that's your mentality, you, you're ha that's, that's, a, uh, that's a bad business mentality because every time someone hits the road, all of that money you've invested into them to train them uh, is in the garbage can. So um, I think that those are two things that firms are starting to think about. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't seen any hard numbers on it. So if there is a particularly recalcitrant managing partner, you know, we may not have the numbers to go into a meeting and show them this is why it matters. Uh, but we're getting there. And I think more people are paying attention. I'm going to I'm going to kick a dragon here and jump back into politics for a minute. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. No, keep things interesting. Do, well, do, I have I have a question. Uh, so, Daniel, you're Canadian. Um, That's right. And I'm curious if you feel there is a different cultural approach with um, Canadians with having universal health care as opposed to Americans where, you know, if we do this, if, if you want to go and try and get it on your insurance, I mean, you literally like have to go to HR, your human resources or whatever, be like, hey, is this covered? Can I get this time off? Blah, blah, blah. Like there's this this intertwinement of insurance and work um that i think kind of adds to that stigma and i'm just curious if you feel in general um that that kind of contributes to a better or different outlook um to to mental health than than perhaps what we have here in the states interesting question so so we do have universal health care but that does not typically extend to mental health care well, forget everything um, I just said. Then never mind. <laughs> so we, we in fact are probably st <laughs> so we in, in fact are still facing, uh, I think, a similar battle in that if you don't have a uh, employee uh, assistance program or you don't have coverage through your employer, because we still have employ we still have um, health plans through our employer to cover what the state will not cover, which typically mm -hmm. includes drugs, uh, things like you know uh, acupuncture, massage mm -hmm. therapy. Um, and also um, to be able to see a counselor. That's not something you can do in Canada for free. Um, and as a result, I do think that that has somehow stigmatized that kind of treatment because if it hasn't been included in our universal health care, then that, that's the government subtly sending a message that it's not that important. It's kind of extra. It's a bonus. Um, so I think we do have to create a culture in Canada that mental health care is just as important as being able to go to the hospital and get your cast for your broken arm. Well, that's yeah. so, yeah, my, my ignorance actually has led me to where I wanted to end up anyway, which was saying that I think overall, and this is just opinion, um, we're not there yet, but it has to be like depression has to be looked at the same as like diabetes or something like that. Like it's just another thing. It's no different. Um, and it, we can, we can take care of it. You know what I mean? But right now it's not, it's this problem that like you said it's this outlier that you have to pay extra for you know right right and, and i think that that does have to change one of the things that makes it a little bit more complicated than a physical illness or physical ailment is that finding the treatment can actually take a long time and be really difficult so mm. diabetes you might know for example okay if you're at this stage here are the drugs that you should be on and here's what you should do in order to keep that under control when it comes to a mental health issue like depression you know, some antidepressants work for some people, they don't work for other ones. Sometimes therapy is really helpful for some people. Maybe they need something else, some other kind of, uh, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, uh, you know, 
a mental health group that they're going to, um, a support group. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky in that sense, but you're certainly right that we need to view it as a problem for which there is available help. Mm, right. And so part of, part of the ideas of getting this kind of conversation going in a larger area um, brings up the, the concept of social media. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's two sides to social media. I think social media is creating a unrealistic demand for certain lawyers that they have to be 24-7 available, um, that you have to really turn the response times back. I mean, that's just business stuff. But how, how, how is social media making things worse for lawyers? And then is it possible that maybe social media is making things okay because there's a place where you can have these conversations? Um, I'm just kind of seeing the two kind of ills or possibilities for social media and lawyers. So again, I'll go in reverse order. There's no question that there are lots of benefits to social media, in particular, as you mentioned, the idea of community building. Um, the idea that you can interact with people who are going through what you're going through, um, the idea that you can share your story. It can be very empowering to people who may not have a platform to talk about that. Uh, so that's the positive side. And, and I think that shouldn't be discounted. Overall, though, I think it is pretty much without a doubt that the modern world has made everything worse in a lot of ways. Um, when it comes to mental health, I think it has really wreaked havoc on our minds. Um, not just the sort of idea of being available 24-7, which I think has been really difficult, um, which is new, um, something that isn't necessarily the result of Twitter or Facebook, but more the result of sort of cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, but let me make I'll give you a couple examples that illustrate how complex this can sometimes be. Imagine you failed the bar exam. Okay, you feel terrible. You feel alone. You feel like um, you're completely worthless. Now imagine you go on Facebook and you see everyone who passed. It's going to amplify those feelings of aloneness. Imagine you're upset because you've worked all weekend. Um, now you see a colleague post pictures of their weekend at the beach. You feel like an even larger failure to your family. Um, now, also, it may be distorting reality. You may not know. I mean, just because someone's posted a picture of them at the beach doesn't mean that their family life is richer or more satisfying than yours. But as I said at the top, you know, the idea that mental illness is when you're having a reaction to reality that is in some way irrational, social media makes it even harder to see the world through clear eyes. Mm. What, speaking as a social media marketer and someone who's been following um, digital marketing, it's important to bring up those those kind of ancillary things because notice how it's once again the mental health problems that surround something are are thought of as somewhere in the uh, the side. It's not a it's not a main thing that's wrong with this. Social media is a is a giant part of it. So and you brought up really good examples, but. Maybe if somebody, uh, you know, our listeners or, or, you know, our lawyers, law students, associates, you know, people who are heading up firms, what's, what's something they can take away from your research, something that can help them better understand and possibly reduce the mental health stressors in their legal lives? So on the point of people who are running firms, I think definitely pay attention um, to what your junior associates are going through. Um, if you think that there might be something wrong, uh, don't hesitate to ask them if they need help. Don't hesitate to ask them, you know, let's say some their work quality suddenly goes down and you feel like, oh, something must be going on in their life. Don't be afraid to ask them, like, is everything okay? Also, don't be afraid to show your own vulnerability. I know that might be a hard thing to ask of people in leadership roles, but if you are consistently portraying an image of yourself as perfect, as flawless, as a sort of beacon of um, of sort of legal excellence, um, it might be hard for someone to approach you, or it might make someone feel like when they're not going through something, when they're going through something or, or having a struggle, that they're alone. So I would consider doing that. That's something I've heard managing partners try to do, and I think they've had a lot of success in engaging with their junior associates by breaking the ice that way. For junior associates, it, it's really tricky. I think part of it is certainly finding a a workplace that you're happy in. Um, if you are at a workplace that's really terrible, that you don't have to stay there. Um, I would say 
that in terms of, I mean, we're just talking about sort of the the 24-7 availability and social media, trying to black out time where you have no contact with that at all, consequences be damned, is as important as it's ever been. Um, There are apps, by by the way, that can help you do this, that can track the amount of time that you're using the phone, so they tell you you're done. Um, Don't be afraid to do that. I think that's important. Um, To seek help if you need it as well. Don't be afraid to go see a therapist to ask a doctor what help is available for you if you're struggling. Uh, That's also super important and something that uh, not enough people do. Maybe even to just acknowledge that these, these feelings to a little bit are okay, but to a lot of it are not okay. It's okay. For example, let's say you're a law student. It's okay to be stressed out a little bit before an exam. Right. But if you literally think that if you do poorly on the exam, your entire future will go terribly for you, then you should recognize, okay, I shouldn't feel that way. That's not rational. I need to either, um, you know, I, I, I need to somehow deal with this thought pattern that is so negative and so out of whack with what's really going on. Right. Yeah, there's there's definite levels. Um, cool, man. Well, this has been wonderful. If people need to find out more about you how can they do that so i am on twitter you can certainly follow me follow me my handle is daniel h fish uh but my main platform really is precedent magazine so uh please read us we publish quarterly we're online as well so you can go to precedentmagazine.com uh we're also on facebook and twitter so uh keep up with the magazine we've got lots of exciting stuff coming up 10 questions we ask everyone Here we go. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Number one, what was the last book you read? The last book I read was a book, uh, it's called Far From the Tree by Andrew Solomon. Um, And um, it's just about sort of parenting, but it was a great read. Excellent. Number two, what is your best habit? Uh, I get up on time every day. I can truly get up on time. Nice. Number three, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, or none of the above? I'd be Twitter. Nice. That's where all the cool kids are. Number four, coffee or tea? Ooh, uh, I guess coffee. Nice. Number five, what is your favorite place? I don't know. A place is hard. I definitely like just walking around the street sometimes and clearing my head. So maybe walking around the sort of block around the office here. Nice. Excellent. Number six, is Keanu Reeves a good actor? <sighs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say yes. A man. All right. Number seven. What was your first job? Uh, my first job, I worked at um, at the hockey rink. I was a timekeeper, so I ran the clock. That is so cool. Uh, yeah. And Number I couldn't eight. have brought a more Canadian cliche to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, uh, That's perfect. No, if you worked at Tim Hortons, then that would have been the <laughs> Canadian cliche. Okay, number eight. What is a skill you have outside your current occupation that you incorporate into your work? So you mentioned that you were a musician. I also play the guitar. And there are some times when I do feel like the kind of freewheeling improvisation I feel when I'm playing the guitar uh, is helpful in kind of getting into the zone for writing. So maybe I would, I guess I'd say that. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Number nine, what sites, blogs, or newsletters do you regularly check in with? Oh, there's so many. Um, I certainly read all of the big American magazines, the New Yorker, Wired, the Atlantic. One newsletter that I've started subscribing to that I think is really good is called The Skim. Um, I don't know if you've read it, but it's, it's a really sharp kind of witty introduction to the day's news. Uh, so I'd, cert- I'd recommend anyone subscribe. It's, uh, there's so much news out there these days, and it's a really good way to get a primer. All right, here we are. We've made it to the end. Number 10, after a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? I read. I'm boring. It's not boring. (laughs) I love reading. (laughs) Cool, man. All right. Well, um, that's it. Thank you for playing 10 questions we ask everyone. No problem. No, that was fun. For show notes, links, and info, go to www.consultwebs.com slash Lawson Podcast. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay awesome.